Once again, welcome. You guys can turn to Jonah chapter 2, but I have a little bit of an introduction. I think the, uh, when, I, when I looked at my previous notes from Jonah, that it was way back in March is when I started this in Jonah chapter 1. So I probably, you probably want to have just a touch of a memory, you know, a little jogging of the memory. Well, if you'll notice that the book is titled Jonah, Jonah, son of Amittai. And to put it in perspective, who he's talking to and when he's speaking, when, when this takes place, if you were to look in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 through 25, it says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. Um, if you were to say, now when did this take place? You just told me some kings. Well, what we have to realize is this was at a time in, in Israel's life and that the country's life that we had Israel as the northern kingdom, Judah as the southern kingdom. They had split. Um, there were, if you go through the book of Kings, basically almost all the kings were bad and did bad things. And there were many prophets that God sent to call them out on it. But did you catch what, what Jonah got to do? He got to go to the king and say, you guys can take back the borders. See, Israel here, northern Assyria, had chipped away. They were constantly at war, constantly at battle, back and forth. And Assyria was much stronger than Israel, apart from the Lord. And the prophet was able to go say, hey, king, you can go win some battles here. You can take back the land. And if you were to research what that land was, it was basically pushing back the borders of Israel to what they were during Joshua's time. So it was a probably very popular message. And you may not appreciate the popularity of that message, but contrast it to what other prophets had to do. Do you remember Elijah? He had to go confront Ahab, Jezebel. I mean, he basically went and said, I'm going to pray and there's going to be no more rain. There's going to be a drought for quite a while. Or how about Jeremiah? If we were to look at Jeremiah chapter 38, if we were to look at Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 2 through 6, that Jeremiah has to go to the king and the people of Judah right before the Babylonian exile, right as they're under siege. And he steps up and has to say, thus says the Lord, he who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. Basically, you need to surrender. God is telling you to surrender. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, this city shall be surely given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Now, that wasn't exactly the popular feel-good message. And the king's officials actually said, let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of the people, but their harm. And King Zedekiah said, behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malachiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes, and there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. 
Most of you all have heard Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, but he basically went and told him what God had told him. Thus says the Lord, and he ends up in the well because it's not what they want to hear. You know, this privilege that Jonah had of being a prophet was during a time of a heyday, a great heyday for the northern kingdom. Now, for most of y'all, you guys know northern kingdom. Well, northern kingdom goes into exile, but that was probably some 40, to 40 years or so after that, around 722 B.C., He had an easy task up until that point, up until we get the story here. Sinclair Ferguson in his book, Man Overboard, and I'm just going to quickly go over this because this was part of the last message, was Jonah enjoyed some spiritual privileges. He enjoyed the privilege of service. Jonah had been able to stand in the presence of the Lord, receive the word of the Lord, and proclaim it to the king and the people. He'd been the mouthpiece of God. He'd been able to speak, prophesy, and what was the test of the day for prophets? Did their word come true, what they said? And he was able to, his word came true because it was directly from God. He had the privilege of destiny. He was part of the big events of the nation and what God was doing. Jonah knew God had set him apart. He couldn't have helped it. I mean, he's going to the king. He was part of God's big plan. Now, you may not think this being part of destiny. I know that, I know that if you read self-help books, they'll talk about it. But people feeling that they have that. And as God's people feeling that they have that for their service to God. Do you remember when we studied the book of Esther? One of the the turning point in Esther's life was when? If you'll remember Esther's life, she was in the harem. She She was brought into the king's harem. She won the beauty contest, became queen, and there were problems arise because an edict went out that all the Jews were going to be killed and their possessions taken. And she was kind of sitting by, I can't really do anything. Mordecai, Her uncle sends her messages, and in the last part of the last message, he says in Esther 4.14, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And from that point on, Esther lines up what she's going to do, and she does it, and she follows through. Sinclair Ferguson writes about this. He writes about this in regard to us as Christians. Few things are more important for the Christian than to have a conscious, sense, a conscious sense of God's destiny. That destiny may not be one of spiritual fame. That is of secondary importance. What is important is that we have some sense of what we are for. When you go about your daily tasks, are you doing them for God? Or are you just doing them because? And you've got some, oh, well, I'm not part of anything. Because each one of us as Christians has a destiny with God and part of his kingdom. He he has enrolled us. He has saved us. He has prepared good works in advance for us to do. So keeping in mind that as we go about our daily tasks, as we take a meal to somebody, Or even if you walk across the street to your neighbors and pick up their trash can that the garbage men have left in the middle of the road. Doing it as unto the Lord gives a sense of purpose for what we are doing. He also said that Jonah experienced spiritual fellowships. In 2 Kings, we have references previous to... um, Previous to where Jonah is the prophet, we have references to the sons of the prophets, referring to young men, young men that God was gathering around the prophets. They served the prophets and saw firsthand what what God was doing. 
they enjoyed fellowship with the prophets. They enjoyed fellowship with each other. There's no way to know if Jonah was actually part of one of these groups, but he had to have known about them. And it could have identified his identity. It could have helped his identity to be, I am part of a group of spiritual men that are doing God's work. Not just an individual prophet, but I'm a part of a group that are doing God's work. We have that same privilege nowadays, don't we? I mean, we have us around us here. We have sister churches. But even more than that, we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. As a saved believer, you have spiritual fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You are able to receive guidance and direction. It's one of the things that we take for granted. All these we take for granted. God li listens to our prayers. So I kind of made the point that we have many of the spiritual advantages that Jonah has. In fact, I would have to say we have more. We, we have the bigger picture. We have what the plan was at the time. In chapter 1 of Jonah, Jonah receives the commission. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. The word of God is pretty straightforward there, isn't it? I don't think there's a need to do a word study, an in-depth word study, a cross-reference. I see a seminary student smiling about that. I see two. But it's pretty direct. Go do this. No confusion about it. And yet, what does Jonah do? And we shake our heads and go, well, if I had that same, no, no, no. Let's be careful of that. Because, as we all know, he rejects the word of God and starts a journey that will take him from where God wants him to go. He boards a boat and goes to sleep. How many times do we do the same thing, though? How many times do we reject the Word of God? Oh, we may not stand up and say that we don't get on a boat and go somewhere. But when Scripture clearly says we are to do this or not do this, and we ignore it. We kind of try to put it in the middle. Or we try to, well, it's okay in this. I mean... We, we can all smile about the, the times that Mitch has shared that in he's marital counseling or something and he's counseling somebody and they go, well, you know, I really prayed about it and God's told me that I should leave this person when they had no biblical grounds to do that. And so as we, as we look at this, let's make sure we're, we, we, we are looking at it in a sense of humility that we can learn from Jonah. Not just, well, he's down there. Jonah runs. He's awakened. He goes to the boat. He goes to sleep. He's awakened by the captain in the midst of the storm, and God points him out as the cause of it to the crew when they draw lots. And he says, throw me overboard. Throw me overboard. Wait, now he goes from this prophet to the king to he's on a boat saying, throw me overboard. It reminds me of Samson, of Samson and Delilah and Judges, this, you can find the story in Judges 13, Judges chapter 13 through 16. He had many privileges. He was set apart from birth to be a judge of Israel, to, to be a way that God was preserving his people. But throughout his life, he turned, he ran, he said to his parents, get me that Philistine woman for my wife. When clearly the word of God had said he was supposed to get a wife from his own people. He touched things that at that time called out as unclean. He had killed a lion and then he came back by after a while and a, bees had made a hive on it and he scoops honey out and eats it. And he even takes the unclean honey to his parents. And of course, 
You guys probably know the, 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 the climax of him running away and, not, and ignoring God. He ends up with a prostitute named Delilah who learns the secret of his strength after, he, after she cajoles him and, and works him to get it and betrays him to the Philistines. And his eyes are poked out. Then he is chained and exhibited. Samson calls out to the Lord then in Judges 16, chapter 28. He's been exhibited by the Philistines. He's been used. He's been abused. And he's standing between two columns, two pillars of a great amphitheater thing as kind of an exhibit. He's still blind but his hair has grown back, so he has his strength. And this is his cry to God. Please remember me, and please strengthen me only this once, God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one, his left hand on the other, And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his life. He had been used to preserve God's people and to protect them. And yet at the end of his life, running away from God's word, clearly living in sin, all he can do is cry out, let me die. That is, it's sad. There are lives around us that are like that. People that are crying out like that. Jonah cries out in that same way in verse 12, pick me up and hurl me in the sea. The sailors don't do it right away. They have more regard for Jonah's life than Jonah has. And, but they eventually do. And the storm stops. The sailors feel the Lord and make sacrifices and vows. And then Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Not a pleasant place. Kind of like the prodigal son in Luke 15 that finds himself at the end of a sinning spree. He's taken his inheritance, he's spent it, and he finds himself feeding pigs with what they call pods, which are some fiber, vegetable fiber things that basically would have no nutritional value for him. And as a Jewish person, even feeding the pigs, he was in the midst of unclean animals. So that's where we left Jonah. In a swallowed by a fish. In a hard place. And what we have is, chapter 2 is, let me read it for you now, and we're going to go through it. And the Lord appointed a great fish, um, sorry, chapter 2, not the end of chapter 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple." The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. 
May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. All I can say is, wow. Somewhere between being the guys pitching him overboard, I've got a picture of, of all the guys just had him on their hands and passed him off the side. I don't know why I have that picture, but it's just a picture I have. All I can say is, wow, somewhere between there and him drowning, he prayed. And it sounds like it was he struggled in the water for a while before he finally prayed. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. He cried as a desperate man. Life was almost out. There was no more struggling to do. There was no more running to do. And he called on the Lord. And he writes a prayer like a psalm to celebrate God's answer. I'm just going to compare a couple verses here with some psalm verses. Which is not, it's not strange that he would sound, his prayer would sound a lot like psalms, would it? What was he? He was a prophet. Probably studied those psalms, knew them, heard them. Verse 2, when he says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Psalm 120, verse 1. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Of course, I realize in Psalm 120, verse 1, he's being, asking to be saved from lying lips and deceitful tongues. But it still sounds a lot alike, doesn't it? Verse 3, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Psalm 42, 7, All your breakers... And your waves have gone over me. Jonah seems to remember and rejoice in the word of God now. It wasn't because he was able to pull out his scroll or he was able to pull out his phone and that it was, why? Because he seems to have studied God's word and has more than a passing acquaintance with things and how God works. Do we ever despair? (laughs) Yes. I don't need to ask that. That's a rhetorical question. You guys don't have to give me any nods or anything. Remember God's word in your life. Remember David when he, Psalm 51, where he confesses his transgressions to God? Sure of his salvation then? As Jonah is about to die, he cries out to the Lord, and God hears him. In Jonah's disobedience and unfaithfulness, he cries out, and God answers in faithfulness and loving grace. Sheol that's mentioned there is the place of death. It has several meanings. It can actually mean if you're buried in the ground, it's in the depth of the earth. But it's always used in regards to death. That is how close Jonah feels that he is to dying. He says, he basically cries out from Sheol. And he also recognizes in verse 3, God's sovereignty. For you cast me into the deep. Wait. It was the it was not the sailors that threw him overboard. It was God that threw him overboard. And he ended up getting a dose of, we might call it chastening. But isn't it in a foretaste of the sampling of God's wrath? Just a tiny bit of it. It's, drowning is one of those things that just scares me to death. That's just oxymoron, but it just scares me. I, I remember as a, as a, I think it was a fourth or fifth grader, at the beach with my sister, going out and getting caught in a ripped current when I wasn't supposed to be in the water. She was eight years older than I was. She was being doing the teenage thing and and on, on the beach, and I was doing the disobedient child thing. 
running out in the water when I wasn't supposed to. And I was terrified as I'm... And I floated on my back and then started to swim back. Barely made it back. I didn't... I, I was terrified of the water for a while after that. This is what Jonah gets a sampling of, except he's drugged down underneath the water to the point of thinking he's going to drown. Why do we challenge God? Do we not understand that he sees all? He's everywhere. He knows all. He even knows our hearts. The wickedness we can hide from ourselves, he sees and brings to the surface. Jonah, if you'd have seen Jonah before the call to Nineveh, he's advising the king, he's living the life. You would have thought, man, there's a faithful guy there. Because of what we see on the outside. But what did God see? God saw that, that part of his heart that was not faithful. Jeremiah 17 talks about the heart. And it's a one you may, have, you may uh, have memorized, but Jeremiah 17, verse, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. You know, we uh, want to think of ourselves as faithful, obedient servants. But many times we end up like Jonah. We will only be faithful to this point. Our obedience only goes so far. And if you think I'm stepping on toes now, I've studied this. Like I said, the last time I preached was March 6th. I'm surprised I haven't had to buy new boots about four sizes bigger. But we are also encouraged because while Jonah's disobedience has him cast into the deep, God still heard his prayer and delivered him and saved him. Jonah further describes his position. He feels driven, I am driven from your sight. Which should come as no surprise to us. What does sin do? I know it condemns us. It, it, it does many things. It leads to death. But one of the things it does is separates us from God. God doesn't stand, doesn't, we can't stand in God in the presence of sin. As believers, as we struggle in our life, we have to acknowledge that we have sin in our life and repent of it. His disobedience had, a, had consequences. We have a Bible full of examples of the consequences of disobedience. We have lives that are full of examples at times. Yet there's hope, and he expresses this right after that, realizing he's felt driven. He's sure he, when he says he's sure he will see the temple. His troubles are momentarily forgotten. As he's filled with joy at his physical deliverance, it allows him to have the confidence that if God has saved me from this, will I again once a day see the, once again see the temple? For him, the temple had the symbolic meaning of fellowship with God. That's where God oftentimes met with his people during this time. That's where sacrifices were offered to God. That's where people sojourned, many days journey, to worship God. And he's filled with the confidence that he will see it once again. Just as we can be when we repent. Verses 5, 6, and 7 
Again, the terror of a watery grave comes to the surface. How close he came to death is vividly remembered. You know, it's almost as though he was about to quit struggling because he couldn't struggle anymore. If this were an Old West movie and the, somebody had been unfairly sentenced, he would have eaten his last meal. He would have had a preacher come to him. He would have been led out to the gallows. His face would have been covered, a bag over his head, a noose put around his neck. Everyone would have walked off the platform except the guy that was there to pull the lever when suddenly the pardon comes from the governor. This was how close he saw to his physical death and being separated from God. Psalm, he describes his rescue from that as being brought out of the pit. Psalm 88, verses 3 through 7. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave. Let those whom you remember no more. For they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit in the regions dark and deep, your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. That's what he was feeling and thinking right before God saved him. And then it says, it says, when my, yet you brought me up my life from the pit. It doesn't say he helped me. It doesn't say he gave me a hand, he gave me a boost. It doesn't say he climbed out of the pit on his own. It doesn't say he jumped out of the pit. What does it say? It says God brought him out of the pit. He brought up my life from the pit. Jonah's pride seems to be all emptied, isn't it? Jonah didn't save himself. I think that's one of those things for us to keep in mind that we don't save ourselves. The pride was gone. There was a sense of humility. A man in Jonah's position that was an advisor to a king that had been able to speak great things and it had been able to see them come to pass been used of God like that, somehow was able to puff himself up. And you say somehow. It's natural human instinct to do that. That's what we all struggle against. And out of this comes a humility, this whole thing, which is shown in verse 8. It says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. What had Jonah done? He'd built up an idol of the way things should be. I could use fancy words and say, let's have a geopolitical lesson again about the politics of the time. Israel Assyria, well, God's going to come to Israel and he's going to prophesy to Israel and that instead of, hey, Jonah, go on up to Assyria and talk to those guys, your enemies. And yet that didn't jive with what Jonah thought things should be with the model of the world he had built in his mind. And that's probably the greatest reason he ran. And God says, hmm, Jonah had set up an idol. 
Well, you know, those Assyrians had idols of wood and stone. And they don't follow God. They don't listen to God's word. And yet Jonah was humbled by having to realize he hadn't listened to God's word. The Assyrian capital of Nineveh, the enemy of Israel, somehow didn't deserve God's grace. Israel, the favored nation, deserved God's grace. That's in essence what Jonah was saying when he ran with his actions. Jonah, in this passage, speaks of his own sin. Might also be the sin of Nineveh, but it was, he was speaking of his own sin. Jonah's heart was broken, ready for service. He might have compassion on those people. Because why? He might see that he wasn't any better than they were. You can't do God's work without a note of compassion and love for those around you. Because of the great love and compassion that God has has bestowed upon you is not meant to be hoarded, is not meant to be kept, is not meant to be put in an investment account and it multiplies. Because if you do that, you know what happens? It rots. It's meant to be shared with those around us. It's meant to be shared with your boss, your coworker, especially the one that is hard to get along with, with your husband, with your wife, mother, father, sister, brother, your children. In fact, this moves so much in his life that in verse 9, but I with voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. It moves him to a new sense of commitment. I realize for many of y'all, you all have gone through this process before. I'm not speaking some new rocket science, advanced calculus formula for y'all, but you guys have done this before. Why did it take him to the belly of the whale? Well, there was an eight, a preacher in the 1800s, Char, Charles Simeon, that says, he wrote, to take a retrospect of our feelings under circumstances of peculiar trial is exceedingly beneficial. Why? There are times when we realize in our minds truth which at other seasons have had no weight and no <clears throat> and produced no effect on us. He had had the privilege of service. He had probably known the word of God. He'd been able to be used of God and yet as he works in, as God worked in his life while he was a prophet to the king, he somehow hadn't learned a note of humility. If I can say one thing to you this morning, it's have humility. There, as a Christian, we should be marked with humility. And I know I'm not telling you anything new. I know I'm not giving you great spiritual insight in a new way. I can remember in the last building we were at before this, Mitch summing up about, I think it was about seven or eight weeks of preaching. And he said, and it all sums up to humility. And I kidded him afterwards and said, you could have just started and told us humility. But as we see with Jonah, and we know in our own lives that it, does, it doesn't usually work that easy. What happens when we say we want to be humble? I'm just going to humbly obey God's word. We hit something in God's word that we don't really like, that we don't want to do. But as we, uh, as we look at the trials in our life and look at what we've been through and how God has chastened us, <clears throat> 
how God has disciplined us, how God has put a magnifying magnifier on our own heart as we look in the mirror of Scripture, we should have that note of humility. We should be willing to submit to Scripture, and we should have a care and compassion for those around us. As Christians, especially so, the longer you've been a Christian, the more you should have. Well, I've been listening to Alistair Begg quite a bit. And what's one of Alistair Begg's hallmarks for in his sermons? He always has a song. He's always telling you lyrics to a song. And uh, I'm afraid I did something to the uh, praise team this morning. Well, actually, it was last night when I just said, hey, Chris, do you think y'all could sing this song at the end? And I know that, well, I don't know if we can find an arrangement of it and if we can do this and we can do that. And then I felt really bad about asking him. Sometimes we take for granted what goes on with the praise team and how they're able to just, oh, they just show up here and they play music and we sing along and it all sounds great. It's not like that. It's like preaching if you don't put in the work and you don't have the preparation. But there was a hymn, and I wanted to read because I've intentionally not gotten to the last phrase in verse 9. The last phrase in verse 9, I've not gotten to it, and I'll get to it in a moment. Because I believe it's one all Christians know fairly well. Or at least they should. We can be reminded of it. But there's a song, I was sinking deep in sin. Some of y'all may remember it, or some of y'all may remember Love Lifted Me, the hymn. I think that summarizes Jonah's prayer, Jonah's song up until here. I want to read it for you. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Verse 2. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Doesn't that summarize as we think about that? I know that many people would apply the first stanza to salvation, but many times as Christians, we mire ourselves in things that we shouldn't. And we cry out to him, and he is faithful to hear our prayers. Well, as I said, I haven't done, I intentionally left off while I started to sum this up. The last part of verse 9. And if you look in your Bible, it says, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's a strong, bold declaration. It was true then, it is true now. If you are here this morning and you do not know Christ as your Savior, you cannot confidently call out to Him in your trials. The things that I've said now sound nice. I have to ask, what are you giving regard to? Are you living for self? Are you resting on your morality? Your position, your possessions, your family, your wealth, your education, your good works? None of them. In fact, the Bible specifically calls them out. Good works as filthy rags. On your bestest day, Don't even come close. Repent and believe on Christ. 
And just as Jonah speaks of this being saved out of a physical distress, you will be saved out of your sin. And that hymn, Love Lifted Me, has a third verse. It says, souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be. Be saved today. Let's pray. Lord, I know that as I spoke, there are two groups of people here this morning. There are those whom you have graciously saved, who have called upon your son's name, have called on the name of Jesus, and are struggling to live out the life, struggling to live out the Christian life. Some may be caught and mired in sin, like Jonah, desperate. Some may be contemplating that I just wish you would take me. Lord, I pray that you will press upon their hearts that they might call on you There are those that are living a life that may be like Jonah was before his, before his call to Nineveh. Lord, I pray that you will graciously show us our hearts that we may be found faithful to serve you, that you may, we may be prepared for when you say, arise, go to Nineveh, that we will go. And Lord, for the third group, those that do not know you, have no hope of eternity, have no solid hope of eternity. Lord, I pray that you will press upon their hearts, that they will call upon you for salvation this day. They will repent of their sins, they will believe and follow you, that we may have spiritual fellowship with each other here, that we may rejoice in your working in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.